hello, hello. So my name is Merlin Crossley. I'm BBC Academic Quality. Uh, it is just absolutely wonderful to see everyone here in person, uh, to welcome our guest and uh, to introduce a few people who will welcome him uh, formally. I want to start by acknowledging the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, the nation, the traditional owners of this land. Uh, we're on their country whose sovereignty wasn't ceded. And, uh, and we continue to learn a lot from indigenous perspectives, histories, ways of learning and, uh, and passing on knowledge. So with that, I just want to say a few things. We're, in, we're back in person. We're in person because we all want to have a, a drink together. It's best <laughs> not to drink alone at the end. Uh, it's also because we like to see each other. We will record it for prosperity, so it will eventually be lodged in the British Library with all the uh, other Scienti education lectures. I absolutely love the Scienti Education Academy and the Scienti Education lectures. I want to thank uh, Patsy and Nalini who are here for leading the academy. It's 50 of our most highly respected teachers and it has the effect of sharing uh, wisdom. Uh, it has the effect of uh, emphasizing how important good teaching is to our students and to our staff. Uh, and it also has the effect of get getting people together to uh, trying to tackle the big questions of our time. I want to acknowledge uh, Kath Ellis's work, who's, who's here, and I'll hand over to a minute. In a minute, uh, Kath, uh, you know, saw, foresaw the changes in education as things were going digital. She foresaw the rise of contract cheating, and she's led research uh, internationally in this area, and also helped advise people in the university, including me. I've benefited a lot from uh, Kath's wisdom. But I also love the fact that when we tackle these things, we're also getting international, national people in and uh, sharing global wisdom. I think there's a bit of, the world's at a bit of a turning point in. Uh, ChatGPT shares all global widget information, uh, but I don't know whether it can synthesize new, new information. It may well be able to, uh, but at the moment we're at this crossroads, it's a huge, step forward and I think we're going to need every brain that's available to us in the room today to sort these things out. But this is the first lecture I think this year we're going to have five of them in person. Please come along tell your friends. It's almost full but there's about five seats left so the next one will be absolutely full. Over to you Professor Kat Ellis and Kat thank you very much for this. Thanks, Professor Crossley, Merlin, as we like to call you. Um, thank you also for those kind words. Um, and thanks for joining us here today, and thank you for hosting us, um, Patsy, and the Science Your Education Academy. Um, I'm going to introduce Dan in a moment, but I just wanted to say a few quick things. Um, it's uh, amazing. I've looked, run my eye over the people who've accepted it, and I've had great pleasure in meeting people that I've worked closely with a few times already today. One of the things that really struck me when I ran my eye over the um, acceptance list for this event is just how many professional staff are joining us here today. And if you wouldn't mind professional staff, if you could wave your arms in the air like you just don't care, or even stand up, just to see how many people in this room are professional colleagues coming to a research seminar. And that speaks to, I think, the outstanding leadership we have in integrity here at UNSW led by Professor Crossley and Ron Green and Neil and the whole team in the Conduct and Integrity Office. It really is a partnership model between those of us on the academic side who have the subject matter expertise, but our extraordinary investigation or our Integrity Office team who have deep and rich knowledge in the practice of investigating, detecting and managing cheating behaviours and academic misconduct behaviours. And just how much I value that partnership, personally, I think I speak on behalf of all of the other academics in the room, of just how important it is for us to be working in partnership with a professional team, and also other people who are supporting the more academic integrity side of the situation. So I just wanted to call that out and acknowledge it um, and celebrate it. And also just say hi to my education focus community. Um, I just want to run around the room and hug everyone. 
Um, but we do um, we do have such an amazing community. I know a lot of people who are education focused. Anyway, to the star of the day, Dan, Ricky, and I go back for about four hours or so. <laughs> um, we met um, at about eleven o'clock over coffee on coffee on campus. Um, but actually, my uh, understanding of, of Dan's work and the work he does with his colleagues dates back further than that to 2015, when he published a paper with a, a group of colleagues, one of whom is actually a co-author of mine, um, as it so happens. Um, never met him, but um, worked with him. Um, and it, it was a piece of work that I hope you spent some time at least referring to today, but I know you're building on today which really changed my thinking on the problem that we face when it comes to academic misconduct. It set me on a completely new train of thought. And I think that the type of work that he's going to share with us today is, um, there's not enough of it. What's the word for that? There's not enough of it. There needs to be more. So I'm here saying, do more, Dan, do more. Um, I think, Dan, you'd be the first to say, you're not, you wouldn't identify as an academic integrity scholar in the same way that, say, I do, or Professor Anne Hodgson, who's here from the University of Wollongong, would identify as an academic integrity scholar. But the work that you have done has contributed hugely to a lot of people's thinking and also to a lot of people's practice in terms of how we manage academic misconduct and integrity. I won't say anything more about Dan, I think he can probably introduce himself better than I can, but he's visiting us um, from the University of Manchester and is here to share his thoughts on grades, risk and psychopathy. How do I pronounce that? Psychopathy? Students' willingness to pay for essays. Over to you, Dan. Thank you. Here we go. Um, I'd like to add my acknowledgement uh, of the traditional custodians of the land and say thank you very much for inviting me and having me here. Um, it's amazing to be here. I, um, I was last here in March 2020 and uh, <laughs> so it wasn't my fault uh, but um, yeah it's um, a, lot, a lot of water under the bridge and uh, it's great to be back and thanks for inviting me and it's been great to meet Kath and the colleagues that I've met this morning and I look forward to talking to as many of you as possible during this session but also afterwards more informally that would be great. Um, so the work I'm going to present is joint with Kel Tremaine at Western Sydney University and Guy Curtis at the University of Western Australia. I'm an adjunct at UWA and that's why I'm on research leave at the moment, just on a bit of a tour from there. Uh, it's joint work. The, uh, Kel and Guy are psychologists. I'm an economist. We all work in universities and therefore, whatever our disciplinary histories and, and tastes, we also have to engage with and care about academic integrity. And it's a case of uh, our disciplinary interests also relating to the, our teaching, etc. Those things are sort of folded in on each other. Um, I think this is changing, and my, as a result of being talking to Kath and colleagues today, my understanding of it is changing dramatically. I would typically, like last week when I presented this, I would say contract cheating and, and students' willingness to, to buy coursework uh, is an area which is short on data and good on stories. Uh, I think that's changing. There's a lot more data now, I think, which is being used. But story. So I thought it's nice to start a presentation with a very personal story. Um, so ever since I accidentally burnt holes in my pyjamas after experimenting with a chemistry set on my eighth birthday, I've always had a passion for science. Uh, That's a very moving story. Uh, in the UK, when students apply for their undergraduate, they do a personal statement. And this personal statement, this anecdote featured in a personal statement of a student. It featured in an anecdote of a personal statement for 234 students <laughs> in the year when they introduced Turnitin scanning on personal statements in the UK. So possibly an epidemic of pyjama burning, that could be one hypothesis. Alternatively, people are copying and pasting material uh, in their personal statements, which is plausible. Now, uh, this uh, story highlights really, and a lot of this you, you're gonna, you're, you'll know, of course, but in terms of what's driving contract cheating, well, one of the, it's a, there's a co-evolution, a, 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 a mutual development going on in terms of turn it in, comes in, and coursework, etc., gets scanned for old school copy and paste plagiarism. That reduces some plagiarism, but new forms arise, and we have the rise of contract cheating. So students contracting out, outsourcing their work, whether commercially or to friends and family in order to get that done. 
And um, how I got into this, uh, this is a true story. This is not just a, a, a fake um, pasted story. This is, this is true. Um, how I became aware of contract cheating was, I remember exactly where I was, it was about 2009, 10, a colleague in the economics department at Manchester, Bernard, came down to my office and said, I just had the weirdest email. And I said, well, what? He said, this, someone's emailed me to say, hello, I did your master's program a few years ago. I now work as an academic writer. Just to let you know that one of your students on your master's has contracted out your assignment and it's come to my company and to me to do. So this immediately was like, oh, okay, this is very interesting. Uh, but also interesting in terms of the ethics of someone and their sort of personal moral code that says they do this job, but then it comes back from someone from their old department and that triggers something to say, I'm now going to uh, sort of dob this person in. And, um, and then we started to get into looking at contract cheating and I looked, started looking at rent -a coder which is one of the first sites for people putting coding jobs on. And then I used to do a teacher data course and then I got an email saying, someone's put your assignment on rent a coder for, uh, to try and get it done. I was like, this is all really getting very strange. Uh, so I registered on rent a coder as a coder and bid to try and get the contract to win my own assignment, so, which I lost because I didn't have enough testimonials from happy customers. Anyway, so it sort of became, and yeah, ethically, I, anyway, let's not get into that. Um, so. Uh, it sort of came, sort of just sort of came into our world, and, and contract cheating has proliferated um, and become a serious issue. I normally have lots of screenshots of Oxford essays and uh, UKessays.com, but um, I thought I'd go for top notchy assignments by Aussie PhD experts as my example site. Now, I'm an economist by training. Um, what's the problem here? Well, from an economics point of view, one way of thinking about the problem here, rather than just sort of morals or ethics, is that we have, um, we, we think about quality being signalled in economic markets. So the quality of your, of your food or your car or whatever. Well, grades and degree classes and those sorts of things are a quality signal to graduates, uh, to postgraduate courses or to employers about the quality of the student that they're going to employ. And what's happening, the, more, the bigger this contract cheating problem of people buying in their coursework or getting people to sit their exams, is that the quality signal is diminished, is weakened, becomes more noisy and problematic. And of course, if that becomes serious enough, then employers have to, can no longer rely on that and they have to induce their own testing regime, et cetera, to test the kind of graduates that they're getting. Uh, and it also affects the quality signal about an institution as well, about, well, what kind of, uh, what's the quality of this institution if we can't be sure about the quality of the graduates who are graduating from it. Now, that's if it becomes sufficiently widespread. So there are quality, there's signaling problems. There's another economic problem here which characterizes this whole market, which is, in economic terms, we call asymmetric information which is essentially two parties have got different amounts of information and they're trying to engage. So if I try and buy a secondhand car, I know nothing about cars really. I can identify the color, but that's about it. The car salesperson knows lots about the car. We're trying to do a deal. They've got a big advantage over me because there's asymmetry of information. Well, that's going on here in lots of different respects. We, um, the student knows the origin of the work they submit, we don't, and we're trying to f uncover that and, and find that out. Employers are trying to get information about the students that they, and the graduates they employ. They don't know everything about them. Students who are trying to buy assignments, lots of them get scammed, get rubbish, get nothing, get uh, recycled rather than original work, and they have to expend energy to try and get good information, to get good essays. And writers similarly may well get ripped off by um, companies who don't pay them for their work. So there's, huge, there's lots of strange things going on in this market. And spending times in the forums, you see lots of writers and buyers talking about how they've been scammed and trying to find out who are good companies. 
And that means that information becomes valuable, which means you get things like essayfraud.org. This is when I first got into this back in the day in 2012. Supporting, protecting students from foreign essays and coursework fraud, basically from being ripped off when you buy an essay. <laughs> okay, this is like a quality assurance mark. That disappeared, but scam fighter. So the, uh, lots of site reviews, resolving disputes, thousands of customer comments, an opportunity to resolve that asymmetry of information, try and find out and get a good product when you buy. Now, I, once you get into this area, as you probably well know, maybe probably better than me, you could just go down rabbit holes. So I started to look into Scam Fighter. This is the guy, John, whose project it is. So, uh, so I reverse Google image John to try and find out if I could find out who he was. So I found an Instagram uh, page. Uh, here he is clearly photoshopped in front of that impressive academic building, clearly photoshopped <laughs> in terms of the brand and clearly photoshopped here. So it's a world where on many levels nothing is quite what it seems and, uh, and information, reliable information is, is difficult to get. So I'm also, as an economist, very interested in incentives. The incentives facing students as they study and do coursework and the incentives to follow academic integrity versus the incentives to buy. The incentives facing staff, and I'll limit myself at the moment to academic staff, about the incentives to spend lots of time following a suspicion on a piece of work versus getting on with your teaching and your research and the things that are likely to develop your career. And there's, those two things aren't in alignment necessarily. And the incentives facing educational institutions to really try and uncover the scale of the problem. The, the incentives to look for a bad thing, if no one else in your sector is looking for the bad thing, and I think, I'm, I think the situation in Australia is a little different from the UK. So if you look harder, you will find more, and that can come back to bite you. So, and, you know, the stories, you know, if you look for more, you will find more. If you up your detection rates, you will find more, and that can cost you reputationally unless you fight that reputational battle. So if no one's talking about it and no one's graduating and becoming a pilot or a doctor and then it being discovered that they bought everything along the way, there's, you know, the incentives to really find the, pro the scale of the problem are contradictory, to say the least. So that's, my, well, that's sort of how I come, come to it, really, trying to bring some economic concepts into this area. Um, so the literature, there's a growing literature. Many in this room have written um, academic papers, but also guides, practitioner guides and university reports on this. You'll know that literature, as you've written some of it, better than me. The economic literature, I'm going to do a full and comprehensive literature review. I can only find one paper really bringing economic, really bringing sort of economic choice analysis into this, which is a paper I and colleagues, Michael at UWA, that we did. And so when I got an opportunity to get back into this, which I'd wanted to do, you think, oh, there's only one other paper doing this. Hmm, okay, one lesson from that is it's really not very, it's a dumb idea, don't do it. Uh, or it's a niche, let's, let's go for it, let's... Um, Let's get into it again. So I was delighted to get back into this with Kel and Guy. So what, in doing that, what contribution are we trying to make? It's first, I think, Australian economic study of student demand for commercially provided coursework. So we're going to look at this as just a product and then look at what conditions and effects demand for it. So we're going to try and estimate students' willingness to pay, how much they would pay, WTP, for essays of differing quality, and how risk and penalty it will affect their valuation, how much they'll pay. We're going to try and segment this market in terms of trying to identify different groups of potential consumers. And we're going to look at um, personality traits 
to see if we can see any link between the personality traits and other characteristics of these students with those different segments. So, the characteristics of the essay and the institution are going to be, we're going to look at the role of price, the quality of the essay, the grade you would get for it, the risk of getting caught, and the penalty you would suffer if you were caught. So those are the characteristics of the product and the institution the student is in. The other set of characteristics are of the student. So what, what do they think they'll get if they do this piece of work themselves? That, you think that would have an effect on whether or not they're going to buy their workload, their demographics, and also their personality type. What's their attitude to risk? Are they a narcissist? So that's what we're going to try and do. How are we going to do this? So we're going to use this thing called discrete choice experiments, which originated in market research and have now migrated into economics, health, transport. People at UTS in transport use these techniques all the time, uh, and environmental economics. It's easiest to convey what this is by just showing you one, and it'll become pretty clear. So here is an option you could buy. It is a high distinction essay for $100. The risk of getting caught is one in 100. So if 100 people submit this type of thing, 100, uh, one will be caught. And for those who would be caught, this would be suspended from the university for a year, come back next year. So that's an option, and it's made up of some characteristics. In a discrete choice experiment, we decide our set of characteristics, so different price levels, different risk levels, different penalty levels, and different grades. And with some cunning statistical design, we bundle these together in options. We put them in sets, and we say to a student, which one of those would you choose? They don't have to tell us how much they value it or do any ranking or anything. Just say, well, which one would you choose? And we always give them the, I wouldn't buy any of them choice, just to make that clear. So you can't, we're not going to coerce people to buy. And that means um, that we can start to understand the trade-offs that people are making and the value of a particular attribute. How much more valuable is a high distinction? Okay. I don't know if you uh, recall, but several years ago, Apple, this has been recorded, isn't it? So let's get this right. Apple took Samsung to court over the alleged theft of um, taking of innovations and, and features of phones, one of which was the side swipe, the side swipe across the screen. So as part of that, the research that went into the court case was trying to uh, isolate the value of a side swipe. So how much more valuable is a phone to you if uh, it's got a side swipe as opposed to if it hadn't? Uh, and this, these, they did that with discrete choice experiments. Did this with thousands of US customers to try and isolate the value of the thing that had allegedly, allegedly been taken. So, and these are the sorts of things that uh, companies do with market research companies to understand the nature of the demand for their product or a new product they might bring into the market. So it's a discrete choice experiment. We undertook this experiment in 2021 um, at an Australian university, which we don't name, and luckily I have a, two co-authors at different Australian universities, so the cloak of, cloak of confidentiality is maintained. So I'm a big believer that if you're doing this sort of work, looking at what if, what would you do, I think it's, really, I think it's hard to do that in a generic context because I think it varies across course units. So I think students' willingness to do this, for some students, will vary between units. So rather than just asking, would you do this? I think it, I like to try and say, you've got this thing coming up, it's in three weeks' time, therefore we know exactly how much of a weighting it has, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the, those choice sets are going to be about a particular unit coming up at this university three weeks before submission. We sampled 347 students, all taking this one course unit, all having to do this one piece of work. And uh, seven of them get removed. I'll, I'll explain what happened to them uh, shortly. And uh, there are 10 essay choices per person. So they've, 
take one set, make their choice, get given a different set, make a choice. So 10 separate choices. OK, I should have said, if um, I guess we'll do the big conversational and Q&A stuff at the end. But if there's anything that you think, I don't understand what that means, and that's going to affect you, just do feel free to interrupt and ask me to explain something again. So a little bit about our sample of students. A uh, significant minority had English not as a first language, so additional as English as an additional language. Um, what did they think they were going to get for this piece of work if they did it themselves? So some predicted, about four predicted they would fail. Uh, we have uh, distribution, uh, about 20 of them thought they would get a high distinction, uh, a distribution of grades, and we'll come back to that. What are the other factors which might lead someone to buy? Well, it could be workload. So we asked them how many deadlines you've got in the next uh, three weeks. So significant chunk had four or five assignments coming up. Part of the cost of doing your own work is that it takes time. So we asked them, how long do you think you'd spend on this assignment if you do it yourself? And we get that in terms of hours. So a median of 20 hours to do this piece of work. They might be overestimating. They might, there might be a bit of social desirability bias. I don't know. But that's what they gave us as their best guess of how long it would take. So let's have a look at our results for our 347 people. 10 choice scenarios each. 64% chose wouldn't buy in all 10 choice sets. So 64% always chose the none option, I'd do it myself. 36% chose to buy on at least one occasion. So over a third said they would choose on in one of those scenarios. Now, it would be a bit of a worry for me, I think, uh, if those 36 just went through and every choice set said, yeah, I'd buy that, I'd buy that, I'd buy that every time. Because I think, mm, are you just either not really bothering or you just want to, I don't know, stick two fingers up to the institution or whatever. So if we look at the pattern of buying, here's our 64% who never buy, so they don't buy any. There's only 11, 3% who said I'd buy an essay in all 10 choice sets. And the rest are being quite discerning. They're saying, I'd buy that one. Next set, no, I wouldn't buy any of those. Wouldn't buy any of those. Yeah, I'd buy that one. So I find that, I find that disturbing on one level, but I find it reassuring in terms of behavioral response and do I think they're taking it seriously. OK. We then ask people, um, these two groups are perhaps some of the most interesting. So we asked the people, uh, these people, we said, oh, we noticed that you never chose to buy. Could you tell us why that was? And the most common response to our preset set of answers was around morality and ethics. It's wrong to do this. These 22, it's not about that at all. It's about basically the nature of the product. The risk was too high, the penalty was too high, or the price was too high. Give them a different scenario, different product, different regime, they're potentially in the market. We also asked the people who chose to buy on all 10 occasions. We noticed you bought on every occasion. Why was that? 7% said, I didn't take account of the prices because it was just hypothetical. As an economist, <clears throat> that's a big no. You're at, we've enjoyed having you in the process, but please, now you, we've, it's time to leave the game because if people aren't taking price seriously, we can't economically analyze their choices. So those are the seven who we remove at this point. The other four who always chose just said it was the benefit cost sort of thing was, was good enough. Uh, the benefits from not having to do the work was always worth paying despite the risk. So these four are sort of saying they're weighing it up, but it's just that the product was worth buying on every occasion. We now get into some more systematic statistical analysis of the choices. Um, the basic premise of a discrete choice experiment is you just choose the thing you prefer. Just choose the option you prefer. That's all you've got to do. And where do people get value, or in economic terms, utility from an essay? Well, it's, they get uh, the things that give them something, give value from the essay. 
Well, it's affected by the cost of it, the grade of it, the risk of being caught, the penalty if you are caught, and there's also the aspect of is it the buy none, do it yourself option? That's got a sort of particular characteristics, as in if you are into the whole ethics morality thing, that's a big plus in terms of it being an essay being the do it myself type. So we think and we assume that people put different weights on those different things. And that's what we're going to try and estimate. This is basically just like a, a weight or a preference about how much the cost affects your choice and how much you value a higher grade. And we have some ideas about whether these weights are going to be positive or negative. So cost, typically people prefer if you hold everything else constant. People don't like higher prices. So we think that should be a negative effect. Higher cost means less likely to choose. Grade, people like higher grades, so we think that's going to be a positive effect. Risk and penalty, we expect that's, we put those up, we think that's going to decrease the value of an essay to people. And the none, well, we don't have a strong prior on that, it's going to differ between people. So these are the things we're going to try and estimate. And if we do that, what we're really going to try and get at is the trade-off. How, how do you trade off the cost against grade? How much more would you pay for a higher distinction rather than a distinction? How, how much more would you pay for a premium product? Or how much more would you pay to buy an essay if the risk was lower? So if you could lower the risk, how much more valuable is an essay to you in a low-risk environment? So we're trying to get these values for these features, like the value of the side swipe on the phone. So we're going to estimate these betas with a stats model. Now, I'm really not going to um, dig into numbers, so we're just going to, but it is useful just to get an idea about does this make sense? So these are our betas we're estimating. The Zs are just a measure of significance, two and above, plus or minus doesn't matter, just two or above means significant effect. It's affecting choices. Okay. So, and this is just a model estimated on, we just remove the people who never bought, and we're just going to focus on the buyers for the moment. They're going to come back in a minute. So, price. I said it's significant, it's also negative. That's a good sign. People are taking account of price in a way you'd expect. This is the value of a high distinction, a distinction, a credit, and a pass being the kind of base comparator. These are all positive. The ordering's right. High distinction's worth more than, a, more valuable than a distinction, more valuable than a credit, and they're all more valuable than zero, which is a pass. That's a base category. Risk. One in a thousand is uh, bad, but one in a hundred is much worse. So that's again, makes sense. Penalty, this is 0% um, for the course unit, for the module unit, course unit, and this is suspended for the year. So again, negative and the ordering's good. Okay. So this is reassuring. And if we drop out, just take the ratio of our beta on price and say high distinction, that gives us people's willingness to pay. So that's $680 for a high distinction piece of work um, compared to a, say, a pass. That is a very, I'm not going to stick with that number because it's very naive in that it's not taking into account risk or penalty or anything. So we're going to get more reliable values in a minute. So why is this not the value I would want to stick with? Is firstly because it's ignoring how risk and penalty affect that valuation, how it would come down in different risk and penalty regimes, which is kind of things we can influence. Um, and this is an average over our sample, and we strongly expect that they're going to be different students with different valuations and different attitudes to risk. So. Let's move on and do a couple of things differently. Let's put all our students back into our data set, all, including the ones who never buy. And let's see if we can identify segments of students based on their choice behavior, on their buying and non-buying. If we do that, let's see if we can profile the students in the different, cat the different segments that we're estimating and see how the value of an essay declines as we ramp up the risk and we ramp up the penalty. So that's what we're going to do. Now, to do that, I want to bring risk and penalty together because 
from an economics point of view, they kind of go together because if you increase the risk of getting caught, well, your attitude to that's going to depend on, well, what is the penalty if you are caught? So let's bring those two together and say, okay, the lowest combination is just one in a thousand chance of being caught and 0% for the unit. That's the lowest combo you can get. And then RP22, that is the highest level of probability of being caught and the worst from their point of view. So we expect this one to be the, the, the least, least stringent and therefore the smallest effect. This one is the most stringent, have the biggest effect. And then these two are not quite sure, but it should be between those two extremes. Okay. So we're going to bring those together now. I mentioned about trying to profile the students who are, make up our different segments. We're going to try and identify. So, characteristics of our student. Um, personality traits. So, um, Guy Curtis at UWA with um, uh, Kiata Rundle did a paper about why students don't engage in contract cheating and found that the dark triad personality traits were the most effective at predicting why students do not engage. I didn't know what the dark triad was. It sounds, I don't know, sounds strange. It sounds, mm, sounds like a terrible cocktail, maybe. Um, this is the dark triad. Narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy, non-clinical psychopathy. Those are the dark triad traits. And so they measured those at the individual level and found those were significant um, predictors of not engaging in contract cheating. So we're going to measure those using um, uh, questions and, and, and est established questions that allow you to score people on those different characteristics. So it's frustrating that they are so hard to pronounce. Machiavellianism, being manipulative and cynical. Narcissism, superiority and self-centeredness. Non-clinical psycho psychopathy, being callous and impulsive. I like the questions they use to elicit this information. So, dark triad personality traits. Payback needs to be quick and nasty. Okay, that's one of the questions. There's a whole bank of these questions while I just show some of my favorites. So, for those of, who so for those of us who get rejected by academic journals, this first one would be strongly agree. Payback needs to be quick and nasty. Uh, Etc. People often say I'm out of control. Anyway, you can do your own scoring. So there's a whole set of, of questions to try and score people on these different characteristics. Um, when we did our first study in 2015, we found that students' risk preferences were a significant determinant of their willingness to buy essays. So we did this with real money and played gambles with them and gave them real cash. Um, this is an online study, so we just have to ask them some questions about their attitude to risk. Similar sort of style um, about uh, what have we got? I avoid activities whose results depend too much on chance, for example. So we're getting some measure about how much they like risk or dislike risk. So we've got our dark triad and risk is going to give us some scores about the students, as well as things we know about the students because they've told us. So their English language status or their uh, gender or whatever. We're going to estimate now what we call a latent class model. So rather than lump everybody together and say they've all got the same values or preferences of an essay, we're looking for latent hidden segments within the sample. And we're going to just try and say, OK, there's two or three or four distinct groups that we can say are separate in their preferences for essays. So they're all going to have their own, left, left that in from an economics presentation, their own utility function, their own set of values or preferences. Uh, and each of our sample is going to be probabilistically assigned to one of the classes. So pick out a student from your sample. Okay, there's an 80% chance in segment one and a 10% chance. In, so we can get an idea about matching our sample to the segments. And we're going to include, we're putting this, doing this on the whole sample, including our students who said no, no, no in all 10 choice sets. So everyone's back in. Okay, I'm just going to tell us. Uh, and what we find is we identify three segments in the data, three distinct groups. This is the first class. Again, I'm just going to look at the size of the numbers. 
So firstly, price is not significant, and really that's all we need to know about this lot. They didn't take account of price. Didn't take account of price. Uh, risk has kind of got the right order. Essentially, these students love, love the buy none, do it myself option. This is a big fat positive, and they don't care about price. These are the students who are typically saying, I wouldn't buy. Okay, so that makes sense. Class two, everything's significant apart from none. So the right ordering, price is negative. The right ordering here, our most strict risk penalty regime is the biggest negative. So it's looking good statistically and for a story. Class three, price is negative. We have the correct ordering, high distinctions, better than a distinction, etc. This is good. What is going on here is these risk penalty regimes do not affect them. They do not affect their willingness to buy an essay. It's only when you get up to a one in a hundred chance of being caught and suspension for the year that that kicks in and starts to dis discourage them from buying, reduce the value of the essay. These people are probably not going to enter the market. Doesn't matter about the price or the risk penalty regime. These are potential buyers, but they are highly sensitive to risk and penalty. And if you can moderate risk and penalty, you can probably deter these people. These people, I don't know if any institution thinks it can get to one in a hundred chance and exclude from the year for an offense, but you have got to get risk penalty super high before you will get these people out of the market. 74%, 19% in here, and 7% are the hardcore risk insensitives. Now, this is quite a nice, nice stroke horrible story. Um, what about how well do, do our actual students and their behavior in the experiment, how, do they, how does it relate? Because we predict for all of our students that they're in class one, two, or three. So how does that work out as a sort of test of does this look like it's plausible? So class one, all of the 220 people who never bought are, in that, are predicted to be in that class. So that's quite good. We have got 32 buyers in there as well. So we should look at that. Class two and three are all the people who, all, um, all the people in those classes bought at least once. So, okay, that's reasonably reassuring, but we should have a look at the, these 32 uh, students who bought an essay in the experiment, but are predicted to be in class one. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the frequency of purchase. You can buy none, once, twice, up to 10 times. So our 32 buyers in class one are people who only bought one or two essays. So that's kind of you can reasonably reassuring. Our class three people are the people who bought 10 times or nine times eight. You can see that these are the hardcore buyers. Again, only four of them are buying on every occasion. They're still, they're still weighing things up. Okay, what about our, oh, I think I might have skipped a slide, yeah. So we bring in lots of effects to try and say, um, ca do characteristics predict membership of these classes? And this is all done in one big estimation. We estimate the latent class model, including the characteristics of the potential buyer. Uh, we find no effect of sex. We find no effect of people having English as an additional language, which we did in our 2015 paper. English as an additional language was a predictor. Um, luckily, because I don't have to say them again, narcissism <laughs> and Machiavellianism did not show up as significant predictors of which class you would end up in. But non-clinical psychopathy, risk, and what kind of grade you thought you would get did significantly predict which of the three segments you were in. So a one unit, so the psychopathy score goes from about one to five or one to six. One unit, one mark increase in that increases your chances of being in class three by 9%. So increasing psychopathy pushes you towards class three. Risk preference, a one unit decline in that risk preference score between about one and six, 12% decrease in your chances of being in class one. So people who don't like risk, more in here, more tending on the psychopathy in class three. What about own grade? When I looked at the own grade coefficient, I saw it was significant. I thought, oh yeah, no, that's right. 
students in class one have got a higher expectation of their own grade. And I thought, hold up, that's the wrong sign. Uh, it turned out the one step increase in your grade prediction decreases your chance of being in here. It is not the case that these are the people who think they're going to get a high grade. It's not just about upgrading your mark in this sample. It's not simply our, our buyers in classes two and three think they're going to get a lower grade and therefore are buying. So what about... How many students predicted they, would, they were going to get a fail or a pass? 26% of class one predicted they'd only get a pass or a fail. Much smaller percentages thought they were going to just get a pass or a fail in class two and three. They more than thought they were going to get a credit or a distinction or a high distinction. It's not the case that it's just low anticipated grade inducing you to buy. OK, finish off with some pictures or a song, as he, I think it's the routine. So, uh, let's not skip that. How much will someone pay for an essay? It's going to depend upon the quality of the essay, the risk penalty regime, and what they think they're going to get themselves. How much of the upgrade are you getting? So, this is for our class two people. Class one, we can't get any willingness to pay because they don't care about price, so they're out. So, this is for a student. These are dollars who thinks they're going to get a pass, how much would they pay for a high distinction? If they think the risk penalty regime is absent, they're never going to get caught or there's no effective penalty, they would buy for about 900. As soon as you get to that 1 in 1,000 and 0% for the unit, that falls to that about halves, down to 500. Beyond that, it's nothing. Well, in this risk, these risk penalty regimes, they wouldn't buy. The value is zero. Our class three, psychopaths, they're not really psychopaths, but there's a high psychopathy score, highest under the none, but they're not affected by those other risk penalty regimes. So their value is just short of 800 and it doesn't get affected. Comes down to about 300 here. So this is, it depends upon what they're buying, high distinction, what they think they're going to get, pass, and the risk penalty regime. Okay, well, what about a student who thinks they're going to get a next grade up credit? Okay, add them in, that's the lower part. Again, the values come down. The class two kids are never going to buy in anything other than these low risk penalty worlds, but our class three people will still spend $350 to go from a credit to a high distinction. We go on, down now to about 200. That's for a high distinction, we can do the same again, simulate, this time it's for a distinction. So you're not getting a high distinction, how much would you pay for a distinction? Well, this is just for class two people, it's much lower, about 500, it was nearly 1,000 before, comes down to about $100 here. If they were going to get a credit, well, to go from a credit to a distinction, they're only, that's the only one they're going to buy here, if they think there's no risk, they're not going to buy in these worlds. So class two, sensitive to risk and penalty. I think that's probably enough. So this is what I claim to do, uh, or we claim to do. It's the first Australian economic study of student demand for commercially provided coursework. We've estimated the value, the willingness to pay for essays of differing quality. We've looked at how those values are modified by the risk and penalty in operation, segmented the market, and looked at the impact of personality traits on those different segments. 25 to 30% are buyers with a maximum value of a high distinction of about $980. The largest segment of potential buyers are sensitive to risk and penalty, and we find risk attitudes and psychopathy affect their willingness to buy. Limitations, extensions. This is one study in one university on one, in one class on one assignment. Got to be very careful about generalizing from that but it would be nice to do more of these things. I mean, it, it, it has doubled the number of studies doing this, I suppose, but it's, um, you know, we have, we, ha we can say our results are statistically robust within it, but in terms of saying this is representative of a broader market, we have to be very cautious. But if you have, I don't know if I'm allowed to pitch, but if you have units and students and you want to talk about running this kind of experiment, subject to ethics, which we obviously do, um, we could talk about that. 
What else have we got? We've got, we didn't have any uncertainty about the quality of the essay. Students who really buy have got uncertainty, so that's a missing factor. Uh, we didn't have anything about blackmail risk and students' fear of being blackmailed afterwards, and I'd like to, I've got an idea about getting that into another study. Chat GPT, <laughs> right? Uh, there was no additional option, and there now might well be, in everybody's mind, an additional option in every choice set, which is the disruptive technology of, I wouldn't buy, I'd use Chat GPT, and we could, I was thinking that maybe we could sort of have a pre-chat GPT discussion and then a post-chat GPT discussion. But these are areas, these are limitations and potential areas for extension. So uh, thanks very much for having me. Thank you for a really thought-provoking um, talk. You. So my question again, comes back to chat GPT. <laughs> so chat GPT is now a disruptor of this market, right? Mm -hmm. So I would be more likely to go for the quality of chat GPT because I'm not paying for it and I'll just take the risk, right? Is that what you think might be happening in terms of prediction? So we, sorry, uh, yeah, so uh, great point. We, a few weeks ago, we were trying to think what our choice sets would look like now in the chat GPT world. Um, so zero cost or um, a nominal fee, whatever the low, you know, there's now a fee for, depending on your level of use. That I think there are issues about how much material, the length of the answers you can get, etc. I think, but I think an issue, it depends what students do with it in terms of use chat GPT as the basis for something that they then write, or if they simply submit their chat GPT output, well, we're going to get lots of answers that are very similar and therefore there's going to sort of turn it in is back in the game and we've got these high matches of similarity and therefore students, it's going to evolve as students' understanding evolves with it and the technology evolves. But it may be that some sort of, I'm sort of expecting that we're going to end up with quite a number of high match cases this time round. There'll be academic integrity processes and then that will again affect students in thinking, ah, oh, okay, I've either got to work, rework my chat GPT output or I need to go back into the market because I need original stuff. So my expectation is that prices will fall. And uh, that, yeah, I'll keep it short. That's my expectation that prices will fall. Okay. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much. I'm wondering to what extent you think that our increasing knowledge of the personality types of our students should inform our design of assessments. That's a very interesting question. Uh, and I really wish my psychology co-authors were here. Um, I think um, I think in terms of in terms, in terms of taking the lessons from this, I think uh, the risk and penalty regimes are things we can more easily control and manipulate, etc. I think um, I think understanding the sort of profile types of the students in terms of um, their, you know, I, th I think different messages and different approaches are required for different students. We have to segment our student body in terms of some messages around uh, integrity, honor, ethics, etc., will work for some students in terms of why you shouldn't do these things. For other students who are more on the psychopathy uh, scale, who are I think that's much more there about risk, penalty, damage, changing their, if they're involved in a rational calculation process about whether or not to cheat, that is the domain on which we should be looking to affect that in terms of them. So I think, for example, on the risk of blackmail, which we didn't talk about, I think that's quite a powerful message to some students about why you shouldn't do this because your provider might come back and turn you into a stream of income. That is a purely sort of long-term, you know, rational calculation, nothing to do necessarily with, with um, ethics or integrity. So um, I don't, I wouldn't profile my student group, think I've got a lot of psychopaths here, I'm going I'm to switch my assignment type. But I think understanding the different factors which lead people to make those decisions and how it varies over units. You know, there might be some units which they think, 
it's not my main area. I just need to get through this unit and I can drop that. They may have a different attitude to that kind of assignment and unit to something that's core to them, et cetera. So I think we have to understand that it's not just there is the cheetah and they are, it's a homogenous type of student and they do it in all units, et cetera. They're responding to a whole load of things about the unit, their own situation and the risk penalty regime. Thanks. If I could just, uh, sort of, this is meant to be a bit of a discussion, but some stuff from my own research is really what we learned from that is that we should be designing assessment for learning, not to try and to stop students from cheating or catch students from cheating. So that's another perspective. The other thing, Pat, in relation to your question, you have to also remember the price of or the cost of delivering commercial contract cheating services also has plummeted for commercial contract cheating providers. And they may be better at taking what ChatGPT generates and turning it from not quite good enough or just good enough to good, great, or excellent. So it's another thing to think about. Yeah, I'd like to add, add, add to what Kat just yeah. said. Um, and right, very in, in, in what you, you said, Dan, is about uh, the uh, staff um, spending more time uh, teaching than chasing the cheaters. And clearly, mm. what you said, there is actually quite low numbers, like 70% will always do it. So why would we bother with that uh, when uh, we can spend that time teaching? Uh, mm. My experience has been I would spend more time on that cheating screen than on my teaching screen for the, te the students I want to teach, so I have swapped my strategy. Cheating and teaching are um, anagrams, and it just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I also had a little rejoice moment that the 7% that you found is very close to the 6% we found in our survey of 14,000 students, so a little moment of celebration. Down the back there is a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the nature of the task. So have you looked at all at what influence um, the type of task has or the student's perception of the value of what they're being asked to do with this? In terms of the academic piece of work on the unit that they're having yeah, to do? The assessment task, is, does, it have, does it hold some intrinsic value for them and does that for them? So I think that's, uh, that's very um, important and we don't, that's why, I, 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 sounding that cautious note about it's one unit, one assignment, one university, etc., that um, that they're bringing those students are bringing all that stuff in their mind about their attitude to that particular assignment. They, it might be a, this was a first year unit, compulsory large scale first year unit. Um, they might think that. Um, as I say, that issue about trying to get over some compulsory stuff and when they get into their own core area, they'll be more engaged or whatever. I think that's all part of the sort of complex decision making that's going on inside the student's head. And we, until we do this over larger numbers, we don't really have a good sense of that. But we know some things about past work about why students do or do not engage in these sorts of activities. And the, you know, people talk about units being badly taught or not relating to the core area of what I'm into, what my degree is about. So I think those are important characteristics and we haven't, this doesn't allow us to really get into that, but it's clearly important, yeah. Bearing in mind the limitations of the study, um, did it kind of like make your jaw drop a little bit that 7% of students would cheat all the time? And like I might also kind of, direct some attention towards Merlin, whether <laughs> and like, what is it, 35% would cheat in this way some of the time, right? Well, academic quality, former leaders, yeah. Yeah, just someone well placed to comment. So I, I, I mean, sure, no, if you, okay. Um, did mature drop, well, to be honest, okay, I can only, t t rather than thinking about it, I can only, no, it didn't really surprise me. I thought I, the idea of there being the sort of um, hardcore impervious to anything that you um, really, c risk and penalty regimes that really are going to affect them, I sort of thought, yeah, that seems plausible. So it's about 7% hardcore, 19% very contingent on the risk levels. No, well, okay. My jaw didn't. My jaw didn't uh, drop. I think that's all I'll 
say at this at this moment? Yes, so it's a good question. Mine did. Um, <laughs> I, I'm still coming to terms with the fact that there's three different types of people, and I'm wondering whether we could employ the seven percent to work with us to catch their peers or uh, give them some useful employment. I mean, I'm sort of interested in. You know, I don't. I mean, I don't know. Are they redeemable? Are they good if we if if we find the right work for them? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering about this seven percent. But it cats right. It fits with. She's always told me it's about this number. You know, and also, I've also learned okay, the new idea in that. But I mean, I sort of. Yeah, I'm sort of shocked at the idea that there's a person who will cheat again and again and again and again. Uh -huh. And they don't care. They don't care. And so my tour does talk about that. And if that's the way the world is, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of thinking to do. We can have a glass of wine and um, welcome, I will welcome people's suggestions. Can I just add one thing? So this is a hypothetical study, and therefore we might say, let's, let's scale those numbers back a bit. So some of those people said, yeah, I'd buy. Uh, maybe when it really came down to it and the risks and penalties were real, they've come down but even if you halve that which is a big sort of statement of of the hypothetical bias that's still 12 13 percent of of them so um and it comes it comes down to many things but the, we know the value of and um how much more valuable in terms of wages etc a degree is compared to a non-degree and high, we know the returns in wages over a lifetime to different grades of of degree class etc so in a sense uh, you know, there is value, they're very aware of the, va lots of students are very aware of the value and the need to get those things, those particular signals they can send to the market when they go out, if they are more about the extrinsic motivation for study rather than the intrinsic, I'm here for an education, etc. So, um, yeah, I, I, the numbers might be a little high, I think that's entirely plausible, I take that criticism um, with this sort of study. But I think it's, yeah, I think uh, there's enough of them to be a worry uh, in, in terms of us being vigilant. Thanks, it's a really interesting um, study and, and I think it gives us good starting points. But I suppose my, my reaction is this is rational choice and students are emotional beings. Um, and it's classic deterrence theory. So. We always know in deterrence theory there are three groups of people. People will always do the right thing, people will always do the wrong thing. And the key question is how big is the group in the middle and how can you shift that group? So what's really interesting about this is that we can say, okay, we've got two thirds of our students, we don't need to worry about. We could be as horrible in terms of the way we design assessment and it'd still be okay. Um, we've got 7% who really don't believe that what we're doing is worth doing and they may be redeemable. And we've got a group in the middle. So in lots of ways, the focus is really how do we actually make the group in the middle that will make make the group to the left or as big as we can, or the group in the middle as small as we can. And and so I think one of the one of the things that sort of this sometimes misses is the fact that those groups are only when you're looking at it in a rational choice model. So the group in the 64% who suddenly have a crisis in the family, or who's Parents tell them if they don't pass this course, they'll be sent back home. Suddenly, they flip across to the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. So we've got th these are starting points for discussions, and so I think it becomes incredibly important for us to understand how do we create environments where the students feel they belong. And it's really interesting you say that it's first year, because first year is the start of that journey of belonging. So, it, and, and it's a large course, so they don't have that. So the variables actually make it really interesting because it gives us a real real sense on what we've got to play with. So yeah, that's really fantastic. Thank you. Um, that's interesting about um, three groups in deterrence theory. Um, I'm going to pretend that I knew that. Um, <laughs> but I, I do now, so that's really interesting. And I'll find out a bit more about that, maybe talk to you afterwards. I think you're right. I, I completely believe that there are shocks to the system that flip people, um, financial pressures, having to work or whatever, or some crisis or multiple deadlines that mean they can f move. So it, some idea about how uh, sensitive they are to flipping, I think, um, is really important. I think another thing that I think is 
is very important because that middle group was sensitive to uh, risk and penalty is we didn't ask this but we've just been designing a survey which does last this which is to ask about prevalence and risk so are a thousand students at your university on your course or year how many of them do you think in a year will buy and submit something and then whatever number they say say 60 out of a thousand how many of them do you think will be caught because what really matters is their perception of risk and their perception of what the penalty would be and I don't know about in your, your institutions, but I don't get the sense of um, us having a lot of information to students to understand people do get caught and they do suffer penalties, etc. Um, so understanding what their starting point is about risk and penalty um, and adjusting their perceptions closer to reality would also be important. But I agree, this is, this is rational choice. That's why we try and do it near to the deadline so that they are in the mindset of that particular bit of work but you're right, a week later in a family crisis and they could flip from class one to class two. Um, that's really an interesting question. Uh, um, and you, there was a question. Yes, that's yeah. from me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just, this, the thoughts I have are kind of arising from what um, others have asked earlier. And I'm wondering in terms of, I mean, it, like every year, like the statistics you, you gave earlier in terms of the prevalence, and I'm wondering, well, was there any study, an attempt to do it like a retrospective study, <laughs> like to actually among those, that core, that did cheat, that, that were core, <laughs> in terms of like what's their motivations and all of these things, and, and kind of learn from that. I don't know whether that's, uh, and I don't know whether there will be like, whether ethics will ever approve that kind of <laughs> study, but. That's my first question. And then the second one was in terms of, uh, also came from something that somebody asked earlier in terms of dis discipline specific, because it, I, um, I teach in a medical program and we hardly, in my experience, hardly have anyone who, ch who cheats. And, and I'm wondering whether any, any, um, any study has been done in terms of being, in, in terms of discipline specific, like if somebody has a whether task specific as well. If it wasn't an essay, it was like uh, people in like uh, uh, um, I'm thinking people who design buildings, engineers and things, civil like engineers and things, architecture. <laughs> like if it was to produce like an architectural drawing or some like art and so on, would would that affect this the data? Um, so I think others here, Kath and others, would be able to s say more about how prevalence maybe varies across um, across disciplines. Um, I think the idea of going to people who've been, who we know did buy to try and retrospectively investigate that is a great idea. Um, I wish I'd thought of it. I don't know if people have done it. Uh, it'd be interesting in terms of ethics, but, if, um, but I don't know. I haven't seen a study which is looking at a, a retrospective analysis of the people who did about that process. So that would be really interesting. I think the issue about medics, architects, engineers, in the barrier literature about why people do or don't, the idea that the content of the assignment is relevant to my future work is, a, is an issue. So I might be able to get through civil engineering 101 and 102, but I might have to actually design a building at some point. So that would be significant. So you'd hope that matters. And we have architects and engineers who aren't buying their way through or medics. I don't know about, I don't know if you say anything about the prevalence amongst medics. Or any other, or how it varies across disciplines. Yeah, unfortunately, it's quite high, particularly in nursing. Um, but yeah, that particular LA code is blinking on my my research. Great questions, everybody. What a fantastic conversation. Um, I think you can see why reading Dan's work headed me off in a particular direction, and why I'm so keen for him to do more in this area. Um, I found that incredibly helpful, and I know Carol is joining me in thanking you. But just to finish off, I'd just like to invite Merlin back to um, finish off and give his thanks to Dan for the presentation we've had today. Yeah, so look, that was terrific. I don't often go to talks by economists, Dan. But <laughs> I feel that I should now. This is a growing area. It is absolutely fantastic. There is so much to do. 
I am determined that we find a way to redeem that 7% of people. I can't believe it. And it's 8% because Alex said every now and then someone falls into it. I think that these aren't permanent problems. I think we're working on We haven't even got to chat GPT yet. So I think you came into this field at a critical time. I think uh, they say that, yeah, the best time to plant an apple tree is 10 years ago. The next best time is now. Now is the time for us to address all these issues. I don't have the answers, but I love the collective intelligence. I love the way that people interested in teaching are coming together in the universities and coming together across universities. And this is the way we will solve it. And but I also do believe people are intrinsically good. And I'm not sure about that dark trio, but I'll ask our psychologists to come there. But thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you.